it's fascinating to hear that even in writing some of this literature in the 21st century, you still find people who are attempting to center a Eurocentric view or a European mm -hmm. presence in, yeah. in mm -hmm. this literature as well. So Tunde, I'll ask you to talk about that. So looking to see, getting back notes, um, having people wanting to still center a European gaze in a way of sort of making it acceptable. And then from there, go into your own work. You've written fiction for a while now, but never really delved into historical fiction. So why choose to go into historical fiction and particularly that time frame in the or your empire history? Okay, um, so have I gotten that type of feedback? Absolutely, but not, not on the writing. Um, we we're having discussions around adapting adapting the book for film, and the the person that was negotiating on behalf of the um, foreign company then came and said, "We have to find white characters." Um, is, Sorry, wait. I need to ask. I want to be sure that we all understand. They blatantly came to you and said, we "Where have, are the white characters?" We have to we have to find white characters, and we have to. Um, can we create a village? And I, I was like, it's not historically accurate. At this time in history, in that case, there were, there were no white people. There, were, there had been two visitors, and that was it. So if we're doing that too, but the guy was so, it's, it's not nobody's going to watch it if they don't have white characters. So I, I think it's, a, it's something we face regularly, and that we have to, if, for, for me, it's a case of if the story has a white character, it has a white character. If the story doesn't have a white character, then it doesn't have a white character. I, I'm not going to center a story around the white character if that white character doesn't exist in that story. Um, so to go back to um, the why I wrote a photo, I spent some time to think about it. It wasn't very clear to me at that time, but I realized that it was about identity. Um, for example, I'm Yoruba, and that saying I'm Yoruba is a, is a very recent identity. If I was speaking at that time, and at the time when the novel was set, I would have said a very different thing, I'm Ikiti. And another man would have said I'm Oyo. There was no concept of I'm Yoruba at that time. And if I, if, if I spoke to a people person, that would, would be a very similar um, experience. And if I even spoke to um, what the eponymous House Afulani um, identity at this time. Most people at that time would have said, I'm Kanawa. I'm, 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 uh, there was no so good. I'm, I'm from this place and that place. I'm Boberewa and things like that. What I realized was that, was that identity formed and there were, there were events in our history that precipitated those identities and we are not interrogated and looked at those events critically. So I was having a conversation with a couple of friends, about 12 of us, and these are guys that I considered very savvy with history. You know, we'll talk about the world wars, we'll talk about the Napole Napoleonic wars, and we, they, they'll tell you the Battle of the Bulge, this and that and that, and you know all those things. So I casually dropped Kiriji War. Kiriji War in, in Yoruba history is a 16-year war, civil war. Amongst all the Yoruba tribes, there was five people fighting each other. And it was a long war. It took a British um, intervention to um, create a truce. And it's not a long time ago. It was in the 1890s. So it's not a very long time ago. And everybody in the room was black. And I was like, hold on. I, I talked about the world wars. And you guys know the Battle of the Bulge. You know Operation Barbarossa. And I talk about KG. And you guys are guys that I consider historically savvy and you don't know about it. And that's a very crucial point in the formation of your identity when you say you're a Yoruba person today. I realized that, so I started searching and I realized there were not a lot of stories. There were some scholarly articles, there were things that people could read if they were really interested, but there were not a lot of, not a lot of stories that um, people could read and talk about and enjoy and still get a sense of that history. And that was why I decided to write. I wanted to write a story about Kiriji, but when I started researching Kiriji, I realized that the events that led to Kiriji started about 100 years before. So I started that story from that period, and that, that's how I ended up in that period, and hopefully I continue the story and get to Kiriji at some point in my life. So we should expect <laughs> this to be part one. 
<laughs> Your own book is also a foundational novel. It's the beginning. So how many are we looking for in the series? Um, not sure yet. Okay, and Jennifer is not ready to tell us what's going to happen. No. Okay, I've never really known that authors would be such close mouth. I thought you guys would be ready to talk about your work. Uh, okay, let's leave that. All right, let's move to the next thing. So I've noticed that there are some central running themes between all of your work, and much, uh, much of it, of course, again, moving away from centralizing it in a Eurocentric or European um, gaze, but also looking at sort of the identity uh, of what we are as Africans are dealing with individually in our nations now. You mentioned it, Jennifer. Why didn't you mention it? So they mentioned it just now. How much of that identity do you think we can find in historical fiction? Because there is some, there's a point to what um, Tune said. He said about you can find scholarly articles. But beyond the scholarly articles, where are the books that, even though I'm enjoying it and I'm flipping the page and I want to know who survives the battle, I take away the dates and the time of the battle. I take away the king who was ruling at that time. I take away some historical facts from it that I don't feel like I've sat down and, and read a scholarly article. So how do we work some of this historical fiction to also help a young generation of Africans also come to terms with how their identities came to be as either Ugandan or Nigerian in Yoruba or Liberian American. How do you work that in for them? Let me start with you, Jennifer. Um, for, for, for example, in Uganda, most Ugandans are aware that our nation is just like 60 years old. So um, most people who were there when Uganda was being born are, are still alive and they will tell you what happened. But um, what I found that Ugandans were not aware, we've always wondered why their people called the Ganda and then the country is called Uganda. And among us, we don't have words that start with a vowel. Uh, so it, it, it really was foreign. It's until I did research and I found out that because our B, B is silent. So this is why when I say Nasuga, you don't hear the B very well. It's the same with Uganda. You, you know, so the British didn't hear. They, they, so they wrote it out <laughs> of our name. So that is how the nation started. But actually, when you look at the Uganda themselves, they've been around for 1,200 years as an, an entity, you know, as an identity. And actually, we started as clans. And so it, it, one person came along and united, forced those clans <laughs> to be together. And he, the, the, what, they looked at them as bundles. And bundles in, in Uganda are Uganda, you know? So for a long time, we've been worshiping Uganda and Uganda until somebody clever came along and said, no, you're just bundles. <laughs> they just got to, you know, together, those bundles. So now we, we go back to that identity. And we've always been aware that our identity is not so much the Uganda, but our clans. Okay, so my identity in Uganda is not that I'm Ugandan or that I'm Uganda, but it's my clan. Okay, uh, and so now we understand where the whole issue on focusing more on our clans than anything else comes from. And so what literature does, to, to be fair, all this is written in oral traditions, which we tend to overlook because they are not written. Okay, all that I wrote, I got from oral tradition. All the history of Buganda that the European wrote, got from oral history. So I think we need to bring up oral history again and give it its place where it belongs so that um, we can discover much more, okay? But um, I, I, for me to create that Uganda and um, remind people where we came from, I had to go into oral traditions. Do you agree with her on oral traditions? Because with many of us, um, it is about telling the tales of the past. Now, some would say that, Africa, as you said earlier, that the Europeans said Africa did not have a history before colonization. We know that's not right. We know that paper was created here. Um, some of the world's oldest and greatest libraries are based on the African continent. But yeah. this idea of oral tradition maintains because it was it was a thing of prestige to be the person who kept the traditions and the yeah. stories yeah. of your people. But those individuals have literally died out over the years. So that means a part of our history has gone with them. So are we getting fragments of history? Is that what we're plugging in? Is that where the fiction part also plugs in as well? Because we're sort of trying to fill in some of the gaps that are missing because so much of that story was oral. What happened? 
Is that about coming back? Don't worry. <laughs> um, so I was in I was in um, Abidjan earlier this year, and I sat with a griot, and she was explaining to me that they're still around. They're still teaching yeah. their children these yeah. stories. They're still around. They're still passing along those oral traditions. Uh, as consumers, though, as African consumers, you'd be surprised that her her feedback was that we're not the ones who are going and seeking them. If we want information and stories now, we're going to your Google, we're going to the, the libraries, and we're interacting with these Western um, forms of technology in addition to our traditional forms. And so she says that they're still around, they're, they're still passing down those traditions, those oral traditions still exist, they're just not being sought in the ways that they were before. Okay. So the um, what's one of those things the four words one of those things you write at the beginning of your book I can't remember the th that I that what I what I said in that so I said that our stories may be told around the lanterns and the laptops and that's that's what we need to do so when I when I was researching for this work I went to a place called Bo it's it's somewhere <laughs> and there was a woman there that was the keeper of tombs. She doesn't speak a word of English. But sitting with her, I, I was, unfortunately, because I didn't really prepare properly, my phone was dead, so I couldn't record, I couldn't record what she said, I should record in writing, but a good, I, I researched things, you know, from all the other sources, and I had dates and all of that, and when this woman began to speak, almost everything checked out. And almost everything from my more scholarly research checked out against all of the oral things that she said. And what does she do? She watches four tombs. Yeah, that, that's her job. Um, Sorry, who, who's in the tombs? Four, <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. Four laughing. So, okay. uh, uh, one of them was attacked by um, Shoda and his people, the teams. Um, when they did that, they moved from Oyoye, the old capital, to Oyoye Boho, which is this place I'm talking about, which was more defensible. So you had three hills around it and you had no access. So it was a lot more defensible than Oyoye that was a plain and horses could come into the capital. So four Alafins were there, and those four Alafins are buried there. And her job is to watch the tomb of the four Alafins that are buried there, that didn't go back to Oyoye. But the amount of um, history that that woman embodied was amazing. Um, I also did things around looking at sculpture. So I was trying to confirm how the area of Kakafo, who was the central character in the story, looked. And they would say, you know, his head was shaven, and then he would have a ponytail. Now, black hair doesn't do well with ponytails. So I, I was, I was, are you sure these guys are? Then I started looking at some sculptures. And the sculptures head was shaven, and they had a long, whistling ponytail for a man. And I went down this interesting rabbit hole of looking for the ancient hair products that he used to get his hair into a ponytail. But I think what I'm saying in essence is that to research African history, we have to look at sources that um, many people may not look at. We won't get uh, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of writing, but we have to look at those kinds of sources. And it's, I think it's our jobs in this day to translate it into a form where people that will come after us will be able to find it in the media that they are more comfortable looking for it in. Okay. Do you want to add anything before we move on? Yeah, I'd okay. like to add something to that. This idea that written history is more reliable than oral tradition. You know, history, the way we read it, or the history that you read depends on who wrote it. You know very well that all the history that has been written about us by the Europe is not true. So why should you trust free history? Remember, anybody who sits down to write must have seen from a certain point of view. Yeah, look, have five people around the same event and they're not going to write the same thing. So why should we trust whoever's idea of the history? The other thing is memory is unreliable. You know, much of the history that we read, no one sees an event and goes and writes about it immediately. They'll wait 20, 10 years 
and write about it. And it's creative. And they have a story to tell. So all the history that is written is as unreliable as oral history. So it's because we believe that written history is superior that we have problems with oral history. But once you realize what is going on with the written word, you know, it's all the same. I just needed to say that. No problem. <laughs> all right, so let's get back to um, a conversation around some of the themes. Now, um, Ryan, so you have themes of mysticism and mythology running through um, the book. There's also even a point in the book um, where the wind, you talk about the wind in Liberia at the time embodying like ancient wisdom. And the wind says to your main character that if she was not a woman, she would be king. In terms of bringing in sort of that, I, the ideas that were inherent around that time period, how, how did you go about bringing the information and everything together and sort of putting it into the book and embodying it so much so that the detail is of that time period? Okay, could I actually um, go back to the, the question you asked about identity yes. in the book? Okay. Yes, please. And then I'll, of course, go there. But um, so it's interesting to me. And growing up in America, my family was in America when I was five years old. I was born in Liberia. And within an American context, most people who were from the continent they'll say, I'm African, right? And then if you're around each other and it's, it's more insular, then it's like, okay, I'm Liberian, I'm Nigerian, I'm Ugandan, I'm South African, etc. And then within, within, when you get on the continent, then it's specifically, oh, I'm Liberian, I'm Ghanaian, I'm Nigerian, I'm Kenyan, I'm from these places. Then within Liberia, it's, oh, I'm Pi, I'm Pele, I'm this and that and this. And so I wanted to explore the fact and the reality that the African identity is, is really flawed, what we see as an African identity. Because now when I go home, Everyone's waving the Liberian flag, but it's with a bit of cynicism. Because what does that mean? Like, who drew those borders, right? For Liberia, for Nigeria, for Ghana. And so because of that, it, it, it is an exploration of the story, was an exploration of what happens when you put black people who think they have an identity, and that, that identity gets deconstructed, right? It is OK to have conflict. It is okay to not get along. It is okay to be within borders where you're waving a flag and you don't necessarily believe in the flag, but you believe in, in the person that your people were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before that flag was created, right? And that was the, the, that was the challenge and that was the impetus for the book. Like, the black solidarity, um, black liberation does not necessarily suggest a black utopia. It just means that you will have the freedom to have that conflict, the freedom to not get along, the freedom to say, I'm bi, or I'm pele, or I'm pula, within borders, and that's yeah. okay. Yeah. That's okay. Um, so, and the identity, and African identity, I think is still forming. It's going to be forming for a very long time, right? And a Liberian identity is still forming, a Nigerian identity is still forming, even though we're proudly waving these flags, right? Um, to the book. <laughs> to, to me. Yeah, I, so, that's a, I, speaking of Liberia, I find that the character as well as the history is feminine in its resilience. Um, Liberia had for a long time had a period of uh, this a supposed solidarity and an assumed freedom. And of course that after its implosion it was exposed that we had many more problems than we wanted to admit. And since then, since about 1980 or so, it's just been you know, problem after problem after problem to where it's revealed that as a result we're then all very traumatized. And so then where do you go from there? And, and what does that mean of a country's identity as we were seeing before? And to me it, 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 it rang very true that it was feminine. The strongest people I know are Liberian women. Their resilience, their fortitude, and I wanted to make sure that the book was in the perspective of a woman. The book was a feminine story and I wanted the narrator of course, to be an embodiment of that. I'm going to pick up from that because in Chinsu you have six books yeah. that deal with different members of the clan. And some of the themes you have going on, gender, mental illness, history, tradition, family, yeah. um, it was all really all-encompassing. How did you bring those things together to sort of to string along the story of the family and picking up from the themes? Are these themes also that you think need to constantly be reflected when it comes to the 
writing that we have coming out of the continent now in dealing with these issues um, that surround gender and mental illness and health. And even talking about the, um, you have the grooming sessions, yes. yes. And I know a lot of people who read the book are quite particular about you putting the grooming sessions in. Why was that important for you to sort of include the grooming sessions? Uh, well, in Buganda we don't drop the sex. Um, because that's where we pro propagate our nation. So, so there's no job. The, those sessions are serious. But what I was dealing with was the fact that before Europe came, uh, sex was discussed the way we discuss food. And then Europe, it's, it was the same with homosexuality. And then Europe came. And then sex became actually shameful. And then Africans became hypersexed. And then being hypersexed was wrong. And we became so ashamed of ourselves, we started messing ourselves up. So by the time I wrote that book, I was aware that in Uganda, um, a lot of children were accessing porn, porn pornography, you know, but mostly they were um, accessing gay pornography. Fancy that. Um, and I thought, okay, this is because we've messed ourselves up. Okay, Europe has messed us up, but we need to take action, you know? Um, and I thought, okay, let me go back and see what they were doing before. Because when it comes to women, because women's sexuality is very, very, still very controlled, so women, girls are, were still being prepared, but the men were, were not. And so this is why I include, right from the start, when the father decides that my son is going to get married, and he takes him on a walk to harvest honey, and he starts to ask, hey, Buana, you know, what's going on? You know, are you okay? You know, before we bring the bride, you know? But that, ha what has that, that has done is to, to go back to what we used to do. And now, actually, in Uganda, they have radio programs where they say to people, put the children to bed. We're going to talk like grown-ups. And then they talk to boys, and they talk to girls, and they talk to husbands, and they talk to wives. But this is a return to where we were. There's something that was destroyed because we were told sex is wrong. Fascinating. I, re I really like that aspect. Now, today I'll come to you. There is sometimes criticism of historical fiction that it, um, it grammar is not the word. I'm looking for the word here. That it sort of finds a way to romanticize the past, one, and then it's also criticized that if someone is reading it thinking, okay, this is historical fiction, the dates and the times and sometimes the people you create, they sort of get this idea that these people actually existed. Do you take on the criticism that you could be sometimes misleading people with how the facts and the dates and the wars and the campaigns and the people involved are presented? Or is that just a byproduct of writing historical fiction and the romanticization? Is that what? And the romanticization <laughs> of the past. Um, so. I'm very, very, very conscious, personally, in the way I write historical fiction, not to romanticize the past. The past wasn't all roses and um, maple leaves. It, it wasn't definitely. In fact, I think it's disrespectful to the people that live in the past if we romanticize the past and make them into these, what I call, non-people. Because people are not, um, people are messy. Real people are messy, real people are complex. Uh, real people can be good and bad in the same situation, in fact, in the same circumstances. You, a man enters a home and he kills everybody, but he doesn't kill a baby because he has some moral compass that says, I don't kill babies, but I can kill everybody else anyway. And that's very real and that's very true. So respect for the people that you're writing about in history, I think for me, is a guide as to how I approach um, not romanticizing. There's a scene that I usually point to in Afrosia where the prince um, got, the prince was about to essentially go against tradition. He was supposed to die with his father and he chose not to die. And his mom was very concerned. And he got into the room and she was holding 
the figurine of Oshu, and she was muttering and talking to it. And at that point, I could have made a choice to say she was reciting incantations. But that would have been disrespectful to the free of the woman who was praying in that scene. For her, it was a prayer. So I chose to say she was praying to Oshu in that scene. And it's those types of little things that I think that are important in writing historical fiction, where you're respectful to the characters that you're writing without making them non people. I'm, I'm also very big on historical accuracy. So if a person died in history, 99 out of 100 times he will die in my book. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I also don't, I also don't think that I, I'm writing a history textbook. So in Afonja, for example, the actual history happened over about nine years, but it's collapsed into a couple of months in the book. That's, that's um, artistic liberty that I took and all of that. But I also like to be historically accurate. So it's finding a balance between respect for the people, historical accuracy, and remembering that you're writing fiction that should be enjoyed, and um, hopefully it should spark enough interest in people to then begin to research the history themselves, the actual history themselves. It's finding that balance that I try to do in how I write my books. I have just a few more questions and then we'll get to the audience. So please prepare your questions or contributions. If you've read the books, please don't give away too much when you ask the questions so those who haven't um, have something to look forward to. So we, we're talking about historical fiction in the context of Africa. And as much of it that we might embellish for enjoyment, there are certain things that from the 1700s, like you wrote, Jennifer, that we still see in 2019. Yeah. So I just want each of you to think about your book and look at the things that you think either still resonate or hold sway or even still influence us as individuals from the time period the book was set in into today and it's still something that is in reality a part of our lives or a part of Uganda's life, a part of Liberia's life, a part of Nigeria's life. Let me start with you, Jennifer. Oh, okay, that's a tough question. Um, but perhaps what I would look at is what the West calls magical realism, which I call spiritual realism. Okay? So in the 1700s, uh, there were beliefs, you don't do this, if you do it, this will happen to you. That the dead are not the it's the body that dies, but the, the spirit stays with us. And actually you see it in the book that um, so Nakato, the wife of Chinzu, dies. But she's not really dead. She's still around. And the, when you go back to that village, they'll tell you that we've seen her hanging on that tree, that sometimes when it rains she will give you company in the dark when she walks with us. So but we still believe that, you know. Um, some, for example, where my grandfather lived, there was a leopard. And sometimes that leopard used to walk with people in the night, okay? And people used to say, but she's a villager. You know, she died a long time ago, but she just wanted to stay. And so someone said, Leopards are stalkers. <laughs> you, know, you need to run. You need to run. But, and then people would say, no, don't run. Because if you run, then you're... You know. So uh, this is because, I guess, for a long time, we have lived with nature. Okay? So you have a village there, but you have a forest there, and there are monkeys, and there are leopards, and there are all sorts of creatures there. And in Africa, we have sort of lived and found ways of explaining this phenomenon with us. Of course now the cities are coming and we're even driving the cows out of the, of the city, you know, because the city, that space belongs to us. But I think it, it goes back to our spirituality and how we understood the world and how we understood the rest of the creatures we share this earth with. What Yes, I would say that there's still, going back to the identity question and negotiation of um, what it means to be Liberian, I think from an ethnic lens, Liberia's history is usually told through the binary, which is those who returned versus those who were there before, right? Um, and it follows this narrative that suggests that the those who were 
who those who occupied the region that was then called Liberia were treated the same way as those as, as those who returned were previously treated on plantations, and that's that's just not true. It's ahistorical. Um, Liberia is very mixed, and while yes, there is a social stratification, and yes, there was endemic national favoritism for one group, but in 1980, during the coup, some of those men who were murdered were mixed. Me, myself, I mixed my mother's by, she's indigenous, and my father's Congo Angola. And so I, I do think that those questions still exist today. Uh, what does it mean? Um, who am I? What role do I play in the, the country's fabric and infrastructure? Um, and then that conversation has been layered with those who left during the war and are now returning because there's a favoritism there as well. And so, yes, the lingering question of, of who am I in this context? What can I give? What does it mean to have the history that I have, the particular history that I have um, from an ethnic lens? Yes. So, yeah. my, my book deals a lot with power and how people behave around power. Okay. And it was, it was the first most recognizable thing that people said about the book. People will read the book and see characters and say, oh, this person is this person. Oh, this person is that politician. And what I said is, essentially, once there's power in a place and people have to interact with power, you always find characters that behave in certain ways around power. So you can almost say this person is that person because he behaves like that around power. Um, for example, the kingmakers in the book wanted to install a king that they could control. That's a very familiar thing in Africa. Every, uh, politicians are going out of office and want to put the successor to control. And then the guy gets into office and goes, wait a minute, power is really sweet. Um, excuse me, you can't control me any longer. And the guy goes, I put you there, you can control me, and it becomes a conflict. And that, that's the source of a lot of conflicts in Africa that people are very familiar with, in Nigeria, and that happened in the book as well. So it's the interactions of people with power is a very present thing that the book talks about. But I think the other thing that was big in my mind when I was writing the book is how um, it, the economics of a place goes a long way in influencing how people behave without them being fully conscious of how they're behaving. Um, in the book, the the source of the strength of the empire was their supply of horses. And their supply of horses became threatened. And when that became threatened, all of the characters around power began to behave towards the guy in a certain way because he was the only one that could supply horses. It's a very familiar theme in Nigeria today as well. Um, the source of our crude oil, access to oil, and all of those types of things. So I think Economics, how people behave around it, and how, I'm sorry, power, how people behave around power was a theme in the book, and how economics without people consciously realizing it affects um, how they behave. So my last question is a twofold question. I'm sort of looking at the past and then projecting towards the future. Africa's history is a very complex one. Um, if you start talking about our history, five words, if you, if you ask anybody for five words, you probably would get the same five words from any one person to describe Africa's history. So, for all of you, do you think that historical fiction that is centered on Africa, could it help us to understand more of our history and to accept where we're coming from? Then the second side of that is, what is then the place of historical African fiction today and going forward for the next generation, for those of us who are reading it now, for those who are not yet born, who will find a way to consume it and look back at the things we were talking about and we were writing and we were expressing um, in a time, as Tumi said, where they will be using mediums that may not have yet been created. So how do we how do we balance the two? Where our past is and how the fiction may be helping us to accept and to learn, and then how the fiction may also be helping us to move forward and to progress. So Jennifer, I'll just talk about that. Okay, um, first of all, you have to realize that historical fiction is more believable than history. And uh, as I was writing Chief, of course I was doing a lot of research, and I was aware that in Britain, people believe 
Shakespeare's history. You know that he, history is the knowledge of the Bible. People believe those histories more than they believe their own history. And they've grown up, grown into that history. And I think someone yesterday remarked on it, that we write a story about a nation, or we create a story about a nation, and then we grow into it, rather than it being true. So the West told this story that it is this and that and that. We believed it and we immigrated and we helped the West to become what it had created. So um, knowing that um, um, people believe uh, my novel more than they believe the history, because of course I, I breathe life into the characters. You know, you smell, you taste, you, you know, you see everything. I have that um, need to keep to the truth, but I also need to create a world that I want, that I, that I want people to aspire to, okay? So um, much as historically some things may be, not be factual, but if I have my intentions for the future, and I know people are going to look at this past, I'm going to, cre to create that, you know, just to take it forward with that. So for me, um, uh, it, it is, this idea that Africa keeps on looking into the past to go forward. And therefore, I, I mind. I mind the past and I trap it and I put it there knowing very well that we are going in the future but we are going to glance backward. And I know that if they see that they, and what they like, they will take it with them in the future. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, I would say that um, for me, history is, or Liberian history specifically, and the way that I approach it is very unique to my experience as someone who considers myself mixed from a cross-cultural background, being studying my formative years in America. And I think that the reason that we engage with historical fiction a lot of times is to correct the ink histories. Um, because a lot of what was written about us for so long were by anthropologists, were by historians. And so, exactly. And so, because of that, those outsider perspectives, you then want to do this, this business, business of correcting, right? Um, but within that correction, it becomes burdensome if you feel like you are a singular voice. And so, I think in the Western canon for the future, I am thrilled and excited about where Liberian fiction will continue to go because I stand on the backs of Liberian writers like Obama Sharif and Howard Olakai, Patricia Java Wesley, Rothel Healy, and so many others. And I think that if we continue to, or if we continue to share our stories and share our perspectives, do the correcting, but then also free ourselves and feel liberated to explore other stories, right? Like there are Liberian thrillers and there are Liberian mysteries and there are Liberian uh, poets. But I, I don't mind correcting. I don't mind the business of correcting because I do think that it's something that needs to be done. All right, thank you very much. Today? You know, when you look at um, a white man writing the history, so I, I, in researching, you look at guys like Robert Smith and those guys writing history, or even the Clappertons writing the accounts of their visits across the Niger. When you take a guy like um, Reverend Samuel Johnson, who was a Yoruba man, so who wrote the Yoruba history, and almost immediately when you read the two accounts, you can see the nuances in Samuel Johnson's accounts that there was no way that Mr. Smith would have seen it. Something as simple as even when, when he goes into the um, palace and they tell him that's the king's mother, Mrs. Smith takes that as that's the king's biological mother because that's the frame from which he's coming from. Mr. Johnson knows that um, that's not the king's biological mother, that's his ceremonial mother because of these cultural things. The king cannot have a biological mother, and so when I write African um, historical fiction. You can see the nuances that you that nobody else um, that is not African would be able to, and that's what you find in all the stories. I remember when I read um, this lady's book, um, Hundred Wells of Salaka. Yeah. 
And you could see nuances that if anybody else had written about the slave trade, they would have written about how some white men came and whipped people and all of that. But she could pick things that those people could not. For me, that's what um, that's one of the things that I think historical fiction helps to do to tell to to allow people that are reading it to see that Africans are not this binary people that everybody else tries to paint. We are complex, there are nuances in our, and there are, there are reasons for quote unquote our madnesses that the world tries to portray as madness for madness sake. There are things that are driving those things, that, that's the first thing. But also, in Nigeria especially, a lot of our history is told from colonial lens. Yeah. So if you go into schools where even where they teach history, if they teach the history at all, the history is told about you know the anti-colonial struggle. This is Herbert Macaulay, and this is this thing. Of course, they're raising a lot of the women in that history, um, and then when, when the women are uh, mentioned, they're mentioned as um, this is the first she drove the first car in Africa, <laughs> things like that. That are not consequential in my view to the larger role that those people played. But a lot of that history is told as if the history started only with the interactions with white people. And I've seen a lot of young people approach our history in that way. They, they, they keep finding when the first white man appeared. I think that um, the job of a lot of the historical fiction is to allow them to engage a period before that time. Sort of how um, actually things fall apart did for me, where I could see the life, the complex life, the complex culture, before any white man came to Mofia. It was a complex culture, there were people that had all sorts of um, nuances in their characters and complex people that were people. That's, that's what I hope to be able to achieve. But for the future, I also hope to be able to frame the thinking of um, people around these this, this issues of, there are many things that are not new. And the history, when it repeats it's itself, becomes partial. So we can learn from history to engage the future. I think it's important to always stress that, and I think that my work tries to do that to say these circumstances that we are facing today, the complexity of our identity, the fact that there are past troubles, the succession disputes, the, all of those things, they're not very new. And people, we had ways, you know, of engaging on these things. And maybe we could learn from those things, both what they did correctly and the mistakes that they made. All right. Um, thank you very much to my panelists. Um, we'll sit back and we'll wrap up finally. But we're going now to the audience. If you have questions, if you have a comment on any of the things we've discussed as well, we would really love to hear. This is the time for this interaction. So if you have any comments, any questions, uh, please raise your hand. And I Apparently, I will get the microphone to you. Thank you so much to um, all of you for your work and your books. Uh, this question is uh, specifically for Jennifer. I, I don't think I've told you yet how um, uh, how much I really enjoyed Chinchu and how it inspired me to write deeply on a much deeper level. So thank you for that. But okay. my question to you is about the um, normalization is not the word, but the accuracy in how you write about sexual relations in that time, particularly among a particular king in your book, and particularly among some siblings. Can you talk about the process of writing about sex, especially non-heterosexual sex, in, in a historical fiction, and making it not salacious, but just regular. How did that come about in your work? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, oh God, the, that takes me back how many years since I wrote that. Um, first of all, I'll give you context. When I was writing that part of the book, there was a wave of anti-homosexuality growing all over Africa. And in Uganda, we were um, at the helm of it, because we came up with the kill the gay bill. Um, and so I thought, okay, I need to address this, because I was aware there's a historian, our first historian, wrote about homosexuality, about manga, you know, and how it was so natural. 
what are you complaining about, you know, talking to white people because he was educated. And so hearing people in Uganda say, no, homosexuality was brought by the British. And when somebody said, no, it was stopped by the British, said, then it must have been brought by the Arabs because they were here <laughs> earlier. And so I thought, okay, I should create this character. That character existed already, but I hadn't given him a sexuality. And I thought, oh my God, this is him, you know? And, and then, of course, from that point on, it was imagination. I was aware that um, uh, homosexuality in Uganda couldn't have been gay. It, was, it wasn't homosexuality, but there was a word for it. Yeah? It's called Okuria Ebsiya. Kuria is to eat. I don't know what Ebsiya is. But, it, <laughs> but uh, what, whatever, for us to eat was to devour. It, it's, a, it's a positive word. So I knew from that that it could have been negative. So, and, and then I started to imagine what a man who is homosexual or perhaps bisexual, and I, I didn't want to be specific because we didn't know, we don't know. I still believe we hardly know anything about sexuality. We will go to Mars, we will do everything, but when it comes to human sexuality, we are very limited. This is why we've limited ourselves to hetero, homosexuality, and bisexuality. It's far more complex. So I decided not to put myself in a box where I label him that he's this and that. But I wanted to make him the most attractive character in the book, the freest, you know. So I made him the, 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 the general and the one that all the kings wanted to be. And in my mind, he was killed because of jealousy, but also because, of course, he refused to um, kill uh, to kill uh, the king's brother. But uh, when it came to the sex itself, I kept on thinking, okay, he sleeps with women. Why would he go and sleep with firm men? He's already getting that from the women. So definitely, so it's just what I, I mean. It was me imagining I was in. Uh, I was in. <laughs> it's wonderful being a writer because uh, you can be. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah. So uh, I just imagined I was him, and this is for me the reason he was always away at war because we was with young men all the time. Why should he come back? <laughs> She has the microphone, please. <laughs> uh, this is uh, addressed to all the authors. Um, uh, I was really fascinated to hear about people beginning to go to or living oral sources to do their research, and it struck me very strongly that therefore the research is going to be in a local part home language, and I think. One of the things as a reader, and I'm speaking now as a reader, you know, from outside the culture, but I'm still struck, I'm, I, I am uncomfortable, I'm not sure, when I read not just historical fiction, but any African fiction, and it's in English. And it seems to me that it's been almost transmogrified, perhaps the editorial process, it's internationally acceptable English as well. So the, the question in general is, as authors, as writers, what is your relation to the English language? I've had to answer this question a lot because I, I made a um, choice to translate a lot of the proverbs from Yoruba to English in my work. And what, it's one of the questions I've had to answer a lot. Are you sure you're not using the meaning of the proverb? How you translate it into English? I usually refer them to Achebe. When I read when I read Achebe's work, Things Fall Apart, or any of the other works that he has, he writes in English. So you can see that the language he's writing in is English. But I can almost hear the people behind the English. You can see that he's not thinking 
English as he writes this, and you can hear it through the English words, and it's it's how I do it. Um, I write in English, and I was educated in English, so it's, it's the language that I can communicate in probably best. I can speak Yoruba. But when I write in English, you can hear, if you read um, Afroza especially, you can hear the Yoruba when the characters speak, in the concepts that they espouse, even when it's written in English. You can see that they're espousing the Yoruba concept. You can see when they say the proverbs, that the proverbs actually captured the full essence of the Yoruba, even though it's written in English. That's my relationship with English. I don't think it's the only relationship anybody can have, but it's how I have approached um, writing in the language. So the ladies will answer the question quickly, and because of time, that will have to be the last question. But of course, they are around. They're, okay, I'll get some housekeeping after this. Uh, so please go ahead. Yes, I'm, I, English is my first language, so English is the language that I am most familiar with. English is the language that I dream in. Um, but Vi is, was very present for me growing up because my mother is Vi. And for me, it was less about translating uh, the language exactly, but finding a way to negotiate some of the stories. Um, the book begins with an oral tradition, a, a story that I was told when I was younger, which is uh, they would say, my grandmother would say, don't hum up cats. You know, because if there was an old woman who beat her cat to death, the cat's ghost jumped to her roof and, and killed her. And so, of course, I was very kind to cats after that. It was very short. And when I began to explore writing African fiction, I, I said, oh, well, why don't I take this and give the cat a name and the old woman a name and the cat a personality and this village some texture? And came up with about 20 pages or so. When I went back to Liberia and I was talking to my grandmother about this, so I said, remember that, that thing you told me about the old woman who beat the cat? That was the inspiration for this book. And she said, oh, Saratu. And I said, what? She said, Saratu. The woman's name was Saratu. So here I go thinking I'm doing her a favor by like, putting, <laughs> putting this in the story of, um, in, in a book. And she's telling me, well, no, this is, this is not how the story sort of works. So the transition is more or less like her understanding of the story versus my understanding of the story um, as opposed to language. Uh, Jennifer, last comment quickly, or last response to the question, rather. Um, um, writing about 1700, Uganda, before English arrived, I had no option but to write an English that reflected that the way they used to speak. But I quickly realized that um, in Uganda we don't speak English the way the British do, or the way we were taught in class. It's, we speak a very different English, and also we are writing in a wonderful time when we have different Englishes. So we have English. That's Sudan and English. We have Zimbabwean Zimbabwe and English. I understand you have Niger, is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so there are a lot of English. Yes. But there's no reason for me to write the Queen's English, even though I was a teacher of English. All right, so unfortunately, we do not have any more time, uh, but please again, a very big round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> We can do better than that at a Thank you.